Okay, great. Thank you, thank you. Um, Great. All right. So hi, everyone. Welcome to our next session for Adams Morgan Day. This event we are really excited to have happening today. I'm Margot, one of the volunteers helping to coordinate this year's event, this mostly online event, um, particularly around the history and cultural affairs that we've got a full lineup of. Um, so hopefully you've seen some other uh, sessions already today and keep Keep tuned in for other sessions. We are uh, conducting this one on Zoom, but we also are streaming it live onto our YouTube channel as well, which you can access from our adamsmorganday.com page. Just wanted to remind everyone that we have a variety of different events going on besides the uh, history and cultural um, events. We also have dance and we have uh, some fitness classes. We've got live music that's happening through Songbird on Twitch. Um, so please, you know, we encourage you to check those out. And also, since it is a lovely day in Adams Morgan, to put a mask on and head outside and see what the tent is at Marie Reed. We've also got Adams Morgan Day shirts for sale and some masks so you can get your very own local neighborhood masks. Um, there's also a live mural being painted there, which is really amazing and uh, taking, taking shape right now. So we're excited about that. Um, but really excited about this session as well and hearing from our local politics um, and activists and how, uh, you know, we can get more involved and figure out, you know, what our role is in our community as well. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Atiana, who is going to moderate this session and run us through it with all of our amazing panelists who are participating and just another thank you to all of you for joining us. So with that. Over to you. Great. Thanks, Margo. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in and for Peter and Ted and Nick for joining this conversation. I hope John will be able to join us uh, in a little bit, too, if not. Um, yeah, so when Margo and I were talking about this, uh, just thinking about the framing of obviously Washington, D.C. is our nation's capital, and many of us either moved here to work on national politics or um, even our local radio stations will cover national politics as if they're local issues, but there's also so many um, interesting dynamic and important issues that are happening on the community level, at the neighborhood level, and at the city level um, that are unique to Washington, D.C. and things that we are all passionate about. And so I thought that Adams Morgan Day would be a nice opportunity to kind of dig into the conversation about what that looks like, what advocacy looks like locally, what um, political and office looks like for those who serve. And um, and so, yeah, just excited to have that conversation with all of you. A little bit about me, and then I'll do a brief introduction of our three panelists and, and open it up for dialogue, both amongst the panelists and conversations from online. Um, about me, I actually, I've lived in Washington, D.C. for 10 years, and I moved here, like many people did, for a legislative job on the Hill and didn't know much about local politics or um, neighborhood issues. And I got involved in Adams Morgan Day about eight years ago and helped form the Adams Morgan Community Alliance and played a leadership role in getting to know businesses and helping put together the festival. And through that, I learned about a lot of different revitalization projects, neighborhood issues, um, and ultimately about the Advisory Neighborhood Commission, which is the lowest level of elected office here in, in DC. And, um, and through that work, I served one term uh, with the ANC for uh, the Linear Heights area. And it was 2016, I was on the ballot. I like to say that Hillary Clinton was at the very top of the ballot and I was at the very bottom. Um, and it was a, really an honor to serve. Uh, I served with Ted and, um, and to learn about the inner workings of the municipal government and kind of play a small role in that. And so excited to have a broader conversation about what that can look like um, from many different vantage points, both from serving as an advisory neighborhood commissioner, but also as an advocate, as a part of a neighborhood association and what the, it, both the, the nuts and bolts of that look like, but also what the issues are at hand that are, that are part of those conversations. So uh, we have Ted Guthrie, who's a, kind of a long, the longest standing member of the Adams Morgan Advisory Neighborhood Commission, having served since 2013, I believe. 
Uh, we have Nick Rolland, who is the president of the Reed Cook Neighborhood Association here in the Adams Morgan neighborhood, and Peter Wood, who's a uh, candidate for ANC this year and a member of the Sunrise Movement and an advocate for other equity issues locally. So uh, with that, I want to turn it to the three panelists to kind of give some opening remarks about how you've gotten involved in local politics, how you became interested in joining the ANC, and, um, and what that looked like for you. So Ted, can we start with you? Sure. Um, I've been in DC for 22 years now and initially moved here uh, because my partner got a job with a think tank and we were gonna be here for two years. Um, things change. Uh, <laughs> and it, it's been amazing to watch the changes and developments in DC over that span of time. Um, and about the last 10 years or so, I've been involved in the local issues here in Adams Morgan. Uh, initially, I got started um, by being involved with Calorama Citizens Association. And then there was a vacancy in the ANC um, because someone got bought out from their rental um, property. And so I, with about five days notice, decided to run for the ANC. And I've served for almost eight years now, really enjoyed. One of the, the greatest things about working on the ANC is the level of commitment and interest and um, energy and all of that that each of the commissioners bring to the commission. Um, each of us has particular talents and abilities that when blended together, manage to take care of the whole of all of the things that the ANC needs to address. The ANCs are unique in um, government in that uh, DT is the only place that has them. Um, we represent anywhere from 1,800 to 2,200 people, not necessarily voters, but people um, in uh, very limited geographic areas and then sit together in neighborhood groups to try and sort out issues that come to us from either from the neighbors or from DC government itself about issues that have particular interest to our ANC. And when we're sitting together, we are supposed to have great weight given to our decisions uh, that DC agencies are supposed to not just listen to us, but pay attention to us and respond based on what our take on the subject is and to be very concrete in those terms. That isn't the way it always happens. Um, but that's the theory behind it. And one of the things that ANC1C has been very good about is getting active community involvement from people who aren't on the ANC, but who have particularized interests, abilities to come in and advocate uh, with us about particular issues um, that arise in the neighborhood. So that's the thumbnail. Thanks, Ted. And yeah, that's a great overview of the ANCs, which are, like you said, a unique uh, body for Washington, D.C. And I see John has joined us. Hi, John Zatoli, who's also Hi. the ANC commissioner. I love your backdrop. That's Thank the, you, the Adams Morgan day that I know and love and hope we'll be returning to in years to come. Um, and I also appreciate that John on your LinkedIn profile has a concerned citizen as one of your descriptors. And so excited to hear a little bit about um, what that role has looked like for you um, in, in your new ANC role as well. But before that, why don't we jump to Nick and then we'll um, move through John and Peter. Hi, uh, similarly, I, I moved to DC about 10 years ago for a job on the Hill. Um, and stuck around. Um, but last year, a couple of commissioners and myself revived the Reed Cook Neighborhood Association. Um, and the Reed Cook neighborhood spans uh, between 16th and 18th Columbia and U Street. Um, and essentially, we kind of like, we listen to, we work with the members and the neighbors, listen to their concerns, um, and then also like bring those to the ANC, our commissioners, and kind of hope to get some redress for uh, neighbors on that level, but also sometimes going to the council member um, and work generally through beautification. We do uh, quarterly cleanups. 
uh, voter registration drives. So just really kind of try and keep the neighbors engaged and active um, and listening to their concerns. Um, we did like a little census drive to get people to do their census. So just kind of really engagement is kind of our key uh, thing with the neighborhood. Great, thank you. John, uh, can we hear a little bit about how you got involved in the ANC and local politics? Okay, well, I, I, I came to Washington in the, uh, in the Johnson administration. Now, for the young people on the call, that was Lyndon, not Andrew, but it was still a long time ago. See, Peter appreciated that. Um, and when I first came to Washington, I didn't really pay much attention to local issues. I was working for the federal government and, um, you know, I, I, I remember my family saying, well, when are you going to come home to New York? And it took years for me to figure out that home was the Washington area. And, uh, um, but I still didn't pay a lot of attention to local issues until something came up that concerned me. And in, in Adams Morgan, the first thing that concerned me was that hotel that shows up now on uh, off Columbia Road. Um, and I, you know, the question was how tall should it be and what accommodations to the community should the hotel developers make? And that, that issue caught my attention. And uh, you know, that was kind of an introduction to me to the ins and outs of what the Advisory Neighborhood Commission does and um, sort of generally how the DC government works. And John is the newest member of the ANC, um, jumping in to serve in a, a vacant role through a special election, which um, is a unique thing too. So Peter, let's turn it to you. Yeah, hi. So I like to think that, I mean, I'm a candidate for 1C3, so I'm not in a commission, but you know, I have a lot of ambitions, one being to serve the community through an elected office, but other things have you know, been able to address as well. Uh, I think that my path to DC is typical in that it's atypical. I think that we can all agree that there's no one way that how people get here. There are people who want expect to be here for decades and end up leaving after a political cycle. People end up expecting to be here for two to four years and just end up retiring here. Uh, I've been in and out just because I've had family in the area, because I was in school in several places, ended up living abroad a little bit for some of that, and finally could afford to live here <laughs> and found work. So, uh, so I'm here, uh, and I think that kind of getting more to the topic, a realization that's really affected both kind of ANC involvement, but also other types of civic activism is the old cliche that all politics is local, but also that all localities are political. And so that means that elections are important and also they need to be complemented by people who care and invest in also sort of non-electoral issues and platforms. I try to balance both. Uh, I'm in the Sunrise Movement, which is awesome. Uh, it's also very new. It's, I think, two or three years old. Basis on you know, climate justice and environmental change, and uh, just you know, local and national and internationally addressing that. I'm also in a much older organization, which is One DC, which is focused on racial and economic justice in Washington DC. I also do some volunteering. I've always valued volunteering. I think that's how I kind of became more attracted to ANCs because it's unique to DC, like we've all said, but also. Uh, serving the community is a good thing. I mean, it's also kind of selfish. I say this a lot too, that you know, it's good to help others, but you get a lot from helping because you grow as an individual. So I think that I'm just kind of, like I said, typical in that I just want to be part of that growth. So here. Great, thank you. And yeah, Peter, you touched on a few of these issues that are motivating you to run for public office. Um, John, you mentioned how you got more involved as well. We'd love to hear from all of you a little bit about what issues you see Adams Morgan, um, both kind of being ripe for conversation, for change, what opportunities uh, our neighborhood could be taking uh, to, to really be on the forefront of issues that you think are important. What changes you might need to see or what you think we're doing well and what's motivating your work in this area. We can go in the same order. We can jump around. Ted, you're on mute. Yeah. yeah. Um, the real issue at this point in time is how in the world is community we're going to deal with COVID and the incredible impact that it's had both financial and psychological um, on us as a community. Uh, things do not feel the same as they did six months ago. 
and we're in a situation where it's very clear to me that this is going to go on for some some unknown period of time, but that we need to really sort of be strong, be safe, and be together. Um, one thing that has been um, particularly bothersome is to see how, I, I think that we're all um, stressed enough so that little things lead to um, really unpleasant interactions among people. And I think we all need to try to sort of take a step back when we find something irritating and figure out a more constructive way to interact with each other so that we are loving in our approach with each other and we don't assume that people come from bad motivations. Um, one of the things that we tried to do the time that I've been on the ANC is to make sure that our, the discussions on the ANC level are kept um, civil, non-personal, non um, that we deal with the issues themselves and that we recognize that each person has a valid perspective to bring to the discussions um, about the issues that come up and that we all need to treat each other respectfully as we try to come to decisions that will be a benefit to the neighborhood. Um, where we, we had a continuing problem with commercial space in the neighborhood being unaffordable um, and not being actively um, uh, uh, marketed to people who might be able to uh, you know, provide new business opportunities in the neighborhood and that the rents are just too damn high. There's a limited amount that the ANC can do about that, but we have encouraged um, DC government to look at the rules regarding vacant property and property that is uh, detrimental to the community as a whole because it's not being used and maintained in an appropriate way. And there are some changes that could be structured through the council that might well help something like that, where we have certain properties that have been vacant for close to 20 years in the neighborhood. A lot of others that have been vacant for four or five years, that it makes no sense from a community perspective to have these places vacant and not active and not contributing to the community. Um, so that's one of the big issues that's going on. The other one is trying to maintain those commercial um, entities that we have in the neighborhood at viably during this period, which is a real challenge for those who are the business owners. It's also gonna wind up being a challenge for the landlords, I'm sure. And uh, so those are like the big macro issues that we're going to see addressed in very particularized ways, I'm sure, down the line in the next couple of years. Yeah, thank you. And you bring up the important part of Adams Morgan, obviously, is that the business community is a vital part of what makes the neighborhood so dynamic. So while representing residents uh, through the role of the ANC commissioner, um, you're also working really closely with the business community to make sure that their needs are are met and in um, in line with the, the needs of the community too, which don't always align. So well, and and one of the really important things is to realize that we can have win-win solutions here. Um, commercial entities can be successful without having substantial detrimental effects to people who live here. And as a matter of fact, one of the reasons most of us like living here is the wide variety of commercial enterprises that we have in the neighborhood. And being able to be in a walkable, livable neighborhood that you can walk to most of the things that you need, um, which also has an impact on transportation policies. Yeah, it is, it's all connected. And, I, and I'll offer that uh, during COVID, despite feeling very isolated, the fact of, that we're living in a walkable community has made me, remain more connected with neighbors and um, and with those businesses that are offering social distance um, sales in, in as well. So um, John, Nick, Peter, what, what issues are motivating your participation? What, what issues are on your mind currently? 
Um, some issues that like we're working on, as Ted said, one, one of the biggest issues in the neighborhood will be COVID-19, just because as we all experience it, um, we've created a, a little relief fund to kind of help out neighbors who are receiving unemployment benefits, um, kind of helping them get micro grants. So that's something we're helping out. And then, as you said, like more people are kind of out and walking around as, you know, as they are at work. And just kind of finding additional park space for these people on our side of the neighborhood you know we only have two tiny parks unity park and uh, champorama park so finding additional park space um, on where we could kind of expand parks in our side of the neighborhood um, and then also doing a traffic study because cars with our fresh paved roads are speeding through the neighborhood so kind of like more micro issues uh, dealing on like the lower level of the neighborhood association as opposed to like what Ted was talking about on the, on the ANC so you have like Similar but different issues uh, as well. And just to kind of follow through, I mean, I don't want to reiterate, reiterate too much, but uh, you know, obviously we're in unprecedented times. But I think that beyond just kind of the simple answer of how do we get through this, which is very important damage control, this current pandemic has exposed a lot of pre-existing dynamics, which are just being exacerbated. And one, we have to get it so that people in the short and medium term can survive. And we do that you know, mutually through compassion, like Ted was saying. And also to identify how we can use this in whatever way is possible as a proactive opportunity to prevent sort of repeating dynamics from deepening. I mean, it's a hard thing. And an ANC commissioner, let alone an ANC commission in general, can't really, you know, solve those problems wholeheartedly, but you can chip away at it, which is, I think, our purpose. And again, to reiterate, reiterate a little bit, and you do that through a couple of ways at least, which is you know, looking up from the ANC level and the neighborhood level to pushing DC council, to making the structural reforms, the necessary investments, to listen to the people, because the ANC is our mediator of residents to the District of Columbia's government. And then also kind of looking down uh, to make sure that the voices that are not being listened to as well and are being validated to the extent that they deserve, have you know us quote unquote seat at the table. But also just like kind of like Ted was saying, also making sure that we're civil, but civil to the point that we treat each other with dignity because we can't really make much progress as a community or just as human beings unless we have that kind of as our fundamental understanding. I think a specific issue, the small business community is very vibrant and important, but also the you know the vacant lots in the neighborhood aren't something that were generated by the coronavirus. It's something that existed and like I said, is being exacerbated. And uh, not to kind of beat the bush too much or beat the same dead horse, but uh, I think it's important one to attract and kind of re-engage with the diversity of business owners, employees, uh, as well as patrons and neighbors that can make things like 18th and Columbia Street corridors, what they have been historically. And also that's good for you know, the city in general to be a catalyst, not to only just you know, ideally to both go through survival and also be a catalyst for the types of growth that the city can do, which is prioritizing green spaces. I mean, it's literally saving lives in multi psychological ways, uh, the physical health of people, also a business issue to have more people to have more accessibility to the streets and healthy ways is a way to make sure that there's continued revenue. So I think, you know, these issues are easily lumped together, <laughs> but trying to kind of sift through that is the most important way to do it. And to do that, in one, to use the same word, to use compassion, I think is essential. Thanks, yeah, certainly a lot of issues at hand that are all interconnected and that the approach matters um, of kindness, empathy. Uh, John? I, I guess, I, first of all, I concur with all of the concerns that people have already raised. Um, with respect to the housing issue, I would add another consideration. Um, by the way, welcome to that new first new native uh, Adams Morgan resident there. Um, Thank you. <laughs> the, uh, um, the the simple answer to we need more housing is well build more, and um, we could do that by building on top of buildings we have now by taking up uh, green space that exists now, or by uh, sort of popping out buildings that, that are here already. Um, but when you build, you end up intruding on somebody's sunlight, on, on somebody's access to, to uh, ventilation, on, on somebody's access to uh, uh, the, uh, the light they need for the uh, um, solar, solar power that they just installed on their roof. Um, and uh, it's clear to me we need to build more 
but to build more in ways that don't impede on the, the character of the neighborhood is, is a challenge. And uh, uh, Ted knows uh, uh, that often when, when someone comes saying, we'd like to build something, someone else is coming saying, well, not so fast. And, and so that, that tension is something that Adams Morgan has to face along the path of building more housing. How are we gonna do? Yes, thanks. Um, Actually, I had a thought about housing really quick. Yeah. I mean, I think just a way that I try to think it too, because how is one of the biggest controversial issues in basically any city's development is housing. It can get very heated, which kind of goes back to the idea of trying to treat each other with dignity, which is hard in some cases, but it's important. <laughs> and also, I mean, look at all we talk about how these issues connect. I mean, if you're not expanding the city horizontally, especially because of the regulations for height restrictions on buildings, you're going vertically to an extent or you're re repurposing old buildings. So I think it's important to think because a lot of times there's a lot of pressure to not do any of those things. And in an ideal world, we wouldn't, but we don't live in that world. So I think it's important, especially thinking about access to transportation to you know, related to labor, uh, displacement of people from their places of work. These things, have, as we said, all interlinked. So it's important to address that. And uh, you know, I'm a trial, a trial by error and a kind of case by case person. There's no cookie cutter, but if we keep saying no to too many things, we're not only gonna not be housing the people who need and deserve housing, but we're also gonna be having old buildings <laughs> that are gonna be even more expensive to repurpose. So I think that's pretty vital. Thanks. And I see that we have an audience question that uh, touches on a few of the issues that we've uh, already talked about, COVID, uh, business resilience, and uh, residents enjoying our pedestrian areas, talking about the 18th Street pedestrian only area. Um, how is this a good solution for the businesses, especially the restaurants? Um, maybe some of them don't have outdoor seating, the question says, or um, is the ANC involved in a process to close 18th Street to cars on weekends? Ted, John, the, the current situation is um, we had the um, the experiment one weekend where we closed 18th to automobile traffic. Um, and then we were supposed to have a week off and then we were supposed to try it again and um, do some tweaks to try and make it safer, better, all of those things. Um, and then suddenly the day before we were supposed to have our second opportunity to do that. Uh, the mayor's office came down with an edict that said, so long as the um, virus, coronavirus uh, problem exists and there is a health issue, um, we're not going to close down 18th to traffic. And this supposedly came from the uh, Department of Health, which had not participated actively in any of the discussions among the various interested parties trying to figure out the smart, safe, best way to close down a portion of 18th and provide better space, better uh, movement of people who were um, going to and from restaurants, bars, whatever, um, and provide a better ambience in the neighborhood. Um, there are continued discussions, but at this point in time, we have not gotten any sort of indication from the mayor's office that they are willing to close down 18th again. For some reason, there are certain streets that they're willing to close down and others that they aren't. They're right down by DuPont Circle. There's 17th that has been closed off, or 19th that has been closed off for a stretch. Um, there's also, I believe it's 16th further down. Um, and for some reason, they are not willing to do that. My guess is that it may have to do with what we were offering was too good and too attractive and would encourage too many people to come to the neighborhood. Um, that's not something that anyone's actually said, but it seems to me the, the most likely reason that they shut us down on that. Um, we were able to do the streeteries, which has provided some change in the ambience along the street. Uh, but I, I really believe that it does not make us safer to have vehicular traffic along that concrete barriered 
stretch of the 18th, uh, particularly during the prime operating hours. And I'm sure that the Filet and C will be working toward figuring out a better solution than what is currently being implemented. Um, along the theme of uh, uh, every answer begets a problem, um, there are so many stakeholders and so many issues involved. With the uh, closing of 18th Street, for example, we had constituents who came and said, oh, but wait, I need that bus that goes down 18th Street and routing the bus to Columbia Road is a burden for me. Um, and, and so that's the, so the, the transit system is another, another um, uh, factor we have to, we have to consider. Um, in the long run, you know, I've, I've talked with uh, community leaders who would love to see uh, 18th Street as, as a plaza. Uh, ain't nobody has any car going through it. And, um, uh, you know, beautifully landscaped. Uh, a little bit of Paris in our in our own backyard. Um, will that happen ever? Maybe. Um, but uh, you know, these the, again, there'll be people on the other side of that issue who want to drive their car through it. It's tough, tough to come come up with something that makes sense for the you know for the whole community. Yeah, Nick, are you hearing from your the residents you represent on? on what their preferences would be or how best to move forward on this? Yeah, I would say neighbors definitely are interested in, in more of like a pedestrian mall. Um, I think the biggest concern was, yeah, the, the buses and the drinking in public um, kind of issue. It would be great if we could have the pedestrian mall but still route buses through, but uh, Wamada has said that there aren't enough buses to do that. Um, so it is, yeah, there are issues on all sides and. You know, we look forward to continuing to work with the ANC to get a solution on this for sure. I think just to kind of, you know, not to go too far into this issue, but it is a big issue and it's been discussed quite a bit in many meetings. Uh, I mean, we think of this as, you know, we're the nation's capital and if DC and Adams Morgan is, you know, the heart of it, the, the capital, geographically and culturally. And if we can't be one of the catalysts to show that, this is important for an immediate public health crisis, but also in terms of just the future of urban development here in the district, uh, that's kind of disheartening. And I think we both have an opportunity and a responsibility, and I think most people agree on this, that with the overwhelming support for the closure to the street you know, in the medium and long term, it's, it's good for ecological reasons. I mean, fostering a divergence from fossil fuel use and individual vehicular traffic is important. And if we're going to do that without having to sacrifice some of the very legitimate concerns of citizens who use cars for very legitimate reasons with people who don't need cars like myself, I don't have a car anymore. If we want more people like me to be coming and building and staying in the neighborhood and the city, we need to have the infrastructure in place so that those types of people are here and they have the ability to flourish without having to go through these very, very tedious <laughs> uphill bureaucratic battles with different entities. So, I mean, kind of just repeating what everyone says, which is, we have some energy that could hopefully put, put, be put in the right direction, but also, you know, not entirely in our hands, which makes it a bit frustrating. Yes, this is Lionel, everyone. He's four months old. Um, and kind of thinking about, yeah, what you said, Peter, about Adams Morgan being the heart of, of Washington, D.C., both geographically and culturally. And I see Nia joining, or uh, Nancy joining us um, as well, who's documented a lot of that history. And uh, just wanted to touch with each of the panelists on, oh yes, it's nap time. On, um, on what, how, how to kind of preserve, what, what that history looks like to you and from a present perspective. I might need to come back to you. I'll jump in so you can take your... <laughs> I mean, this is a dynamic city, right? We've had one of the things about the history of someone like DC specifically, and Adams Morgan especially, particularly, is how there's kind of a, a grace to the instability. And I mean that in a beautiful way, which is there's never a set amount of people who are here. There's a lot of transient people that come and go for work, sometimes out of control. I mean, just look at, I mean, 
just earlier today, the Smithsonian piece on the history of music in Evans Morgan just kind of shows how this is, history is always rewriting itself and uh, it's just a matter of finding your place within that story, which is nice. But uh, um, it's interesting to see as well because you have a lot of different, like we've talked about, a lot of different interests that often conflict. And uh, we're lucky because we have, I think, pretty genuinely great leaders in the neighborhood who are very concerned with doing things diplomatically and fairly and listening to the very diverse voices and concerns that we have. Uh, I mean, I don't have the solution how to s sustainably develop a place forever indefinitely with all the voices always listened to, but I think it's <laughs> not being an ideologue. I think that's an important thing to try to pursue. Yeah. And for others, even in getting rep um, kind of representation or bringing values of equity into the ANC and the leadership work that you're doing, um, how, how do you approach bringing equity and diversity into um, what, what you're bringing to the work? I mean, you try to find the right allies and the right enemies, basically. <laughs> I say that kind of in jest, but uh, I mean, for, for example, working with 1DC and in Sunrise, uh, you get a lot of experience seeing how one, uh, the truism that the youth are often overlooked in very unjust ways is very true. And also that you know, the youth, and when I say youth, I say it kind of liberally, but uh, very well organized, incredibly comp competent, incredibly passionate. Uh, it's actually very impressive to see just how quickly people will resolve things and just be incredibly insightful. So I think just uh, trying, having good friends that are like-minded is good. Adams Morgan's a great example of how that can be very proactive because so many people kind of get it and are really not only open to, but eager to work together for solutions. I mean, something like 18th Street, something like use of the parks. I mean, just the business community in general is needed support and it's not easy times, but I think a lot of people just kind of took it to themselves to offer that help. We're in a, a lucky position because a lot of people have the financial wherewithal to do so. And also those people and some who don't, I think are very invested in making sure that we do things, which is kind of my motto, which is to each according to their ability, to each according to their need. So I'd, I'd like to look at it that way. Maybe I'll- uh, Thank you. I see Nancy um, has something to offer. I was, gonna, I was gonna say about sustainability in the history. Uh, we talked about the in the panel this morning about SunTrust Plaza and the history of how the community rallied in order to get the plaza um, for the use of the community. And at this point, it, the issue of the plaza has been in court, um, and but it hasn't gone away. So I think it would really be good for the ANC just to keep an eye on where that is legally in order for us to sustain that plaza for community use uh, because developers want to build on it and their original plan was to build all the way up to the sidewalk but we've been able to keep the development plans uh, that much at bay but I don't know I mean I'm not sure where it is in the court now I just know that uh, an injunction was issued to the developers uh, maybe about a year ago, so. The current status is that it is in front of a judge in the U.S. District Court on cross motions for summary judgment. Um, basically, that's a situation where both sides are saying there aren't really facts in dispute. We're legally entitled to prevail. And both sides have said that. Um, whether or not the judge decides to grant that, my understanding, it's been in this for at least nine months, if not more. Probably more. Um, yeah. And generally, um, you know, with all of the stuff that's going on with COVID, who knows where the court is on actually coming to a decision on this. Um, one of the things to be thinking about long range is if we are um, successful in the litigation, at least partially, and there is some sort of public easement that needs to be granted for that space. Um, at that point, the, uh, the owners of the property, which is SunTrust Bank's new, I can't even remember what their new name is, but they merged with uh, uh, the bank across the street from them. And so 
it's it's not clear what their perspective will be down the line if they are unsuccessful. Uh, but it seems reasonable to me to be talking in terms of the city acquiring the property at whatever reduced rate would be appropriate given the um, inability to fully develop the property the way they have planned to um, and find a public purpose for that. That's the very heart of our community. It is the most obvious and visible place in the neighborhood and some sort of um, DC centric solution to what to do with this property is what would be in the best interest of the community as a whole, I believe. And whether that includes um, some housing that is something other than top of the line condos, which frankly, I don't think Adams Morgan is in substantial need of, um, to you know a library perhaps, um, to some other sort of minimal uh, building space that allows the public space to be continue to be used as it has historically for close to 40 years now. Um, what I'd like to um, jump forward with is recognizing that this particular plaza was built before ANCs even existed. There were uh, community entities that arose as a direct result of the proposal to de develop this as first a gas station um, and then as the uh, financial institution. And that we need to pay attention as a community and be ready to get out there and fight for what is more appropriate for the community as soon as, as, soon as we get to a position where we know what's gonna happen with this. Um, because as I say, it is it really is critical. And part of the problem here is that the bank went out and quietly marketed the property without ever, ever letting anyone in the community have a clue that it had plans for the property other than to maintain uh, the bank where it was. And had we been given a clue before the plans for the new condos were dropped, uh, maybe we could have gotten the council to chip in some money to buy the property and turn it into partial parks, partial, um, some other sort of facility. So, I, but I do think that the whole experience over 40 years shows us how people who may not have an official position can be very influential in getting good results for the neighborhood. You get involved, if you've got an issue that is of concern to you, please get involved, talk to people about it, talk to the ANC about it, talk to the um, community, um, based organizations, um, get out there and, and figure out how to make things happen. And as I've said, we've been historically in Adams Morgan very open to participation by anyone who's got a great idea. So join us. Thank you, Ted. And I think that's a perfect segue to what I wanted each of you to offer our what are those channels for getting involved? Uh, what impact do you feel uh, individuals can make on the issues that they care about. Uh, the two things that stuck in my mind from my position on the ANC were both very local. One was about changing the hours of the Murray Reed pool so that it could be open on the weekends. And, and that was in discussion with neighbors who cared about the pool and that was a their personal issue and they were able to approach DPR and get involved on that. And the other was the Walter Reed playground, which a lot of families and parents had a vision for what the revitalization of that playground would look like and got involved, created a listserv and, um, and had many conversations with DPR about how to make that um, as natural of a landscape and the use of different materials that suited the parents' desires for that playground. So are there kind of micro issues or big issues that um, you've seen people get involved in or that you personally have been involved in that, that could serve as an example for others? And how did you do it? If, if I could start with an example out of the 1950s, um, we have a beltway that rings Washington now but that wasn't always gonna be the case. Um, before the creation of the Beltway, there were plans to run Interstate 95 right through the middle of DC. 
And, you know, so if, if you don't like the traffic that's on 18th Street now, just think of it, Interstate 95 being there in its place. Um, but there were community members, uh, uh, one of whom has a park named after her, Ann Hargrove, um, who, uh, who, who, who took that issue on and who, uh, who, who forced the, uh, the federal government to rethink its, uh, its plans for the interstate system and run the interstate around Washington instead of through our neighborhood. Uh, so you can, you know, there are big issues you can, you can take on. Um, if somebody's excited about what to do with that uh, SunTrust Plaza, um, uh, my suggestion would be put together a deal that SunTrust, that the truest bank, whatever they're called, that the bank is willing to, to go with that makes sense for the community and find the money for it. Um, Ted alluded to some solutions that make sense to me. Uh, but somebody's got to, uh, you know, take out a stubby pencil and a pad and work out some numbers and find some funding and negotiate the plans with the, uh, with the community. Uh, but that'd be a great project for somebody to take on. Um, I, I um, personally have an interest in finding ways of uh, making the housing in, in, in Adams Morgan more, more deeply affordable. I mean, if you're only making minimum wage, how can you afford to live here? Well, we've, we've got to find resources to supplement uh, uh, modest income so that people from all income levels could live here. Um, that would be something I'd love for someone to take on as a, uh, as a particular interest. Um, I see that uh, my friend Farzan is on the phone. And just this past week, we were talking about uh, some kind of a um, I don't know, think tank is the right word, maybe a salon where um, uh, people in Adams Morgan could discuss the big ideas and the, and the little things that need to be done here. Um, and that's something that, uh, um, again, would take somebody or a couple of people saying, okay, we're gonna take this on, we're gonna make it happen. Um, I think, uh, Ted, I can speak for the commissioner saying, uh, somebody's got an idea, we, you know, we wanna hear about it and we wanna help you uh, do something with it. Uh, an old an old mentor of mine uh, used to say, "If you don't like something, we'll put you on the committee. If you really don't like it, we'll make you chair of the committee." And that that's that should be our our mantra for for Adams Morgan. Yeah, and I will say uh, any issue or community betterment that you see that you want to become involved in, um, I think joining the, the local neighbor association or citizens association can help amplify your voice um, when there's more of you, you know, at tackling a certain issue, um, as John says, when you come together and you're working together on this issue, the more voices, the louder your voice is and the more likely you'll reach the outcome that you're looking for. So definitely joining uh, the discussion, be it through the neighbor association or the ANC is definitely a great way to get your project or your betterment uh, focused on. And so I liked John's example going back to the 50s because it reminds me of something my mom would tell me. She studied history at Iowa State many years ago, not too many mom. And uh, she would basically, since I was a kid, tell me it's important. You have to know yesterday in order to understand what might happen tomorrow and prevent from repeating the same mistakes. So I think that's important, uh, especially in terms of representation and understanding who's being listened to and being actively a part of the community, I mean, it's a tricky thing. And I think it is very good to have this sentiment of, if you wanna be involved, come involved, we're open. That's, you have to have that, but also we see that that's only part of the story. I mean, it's probably not a coincidence that in this panel, and I know organizing cards, so it's not so much about the panel, but most ANCs are made up of light-skinned men like us. To change that isn't just a matter of opening the door, it's also about creating the environment and being proactive to make sure that people feel comfortable approaching in the first place. Now to put that into specific terms, a couple of issues I've worked on the most lately deal with housing justice, especially with 1DC and Sunrise, especially 1DC and the DC Tenants, uh, Tenants Union. So rent cancellation and mortgage cancellation for those who've been affected or had income affected by the coronavirus and also a longer term issue, which is rent control measures, strengthening those to basically make it so those who are most vulnerable to market fluctuations aren't the ones basically carrying the economy and having to deal with just the psychological turmoil of not knowing where they might sleep soon or something you know similar to that. I, there's a lot of people that have been very active in Adams Morgan, in the District of Columbia, in the DMV, 
in working for housing justice, but we see that a lot of people don't get involved with ANCs in specific for a multitude of reasons. And I think one of the many reasons is that it's often, for very understandable reasons, a very mundane atmosphere. I mean, it's very important mundane things that ANCs do, and you can't change that. The meetings I enjoy, I'm kind of a wonk where I, <laughs> I think that the granular is interesting, but it's okay that most people aren't like that. And you have to offer a diversity of outlets and inlets so that people feel that going to an ANC meeting isn't necessarily just four hours of listening to one specific property owner talk about how they don't want their property value to depreciate. That's an important issue. And it's also one of many issues. And in order to hear from people and get them to feel comfortable, you have to have social issues. You have to, for example, I'm organizing a Cal Ram with a park cleanup. People want to be involved in getting into the green spaces, keeping them maintained. Uh, this weekend I was with Sunrise and the one DC doing get out the vote and helping clean up Ward 8. I mean, these issues are things people like to get their hands dirty, people like to be active, offering that as proactive ways so that people can see that they're valued and understood as the kind of initiating factor to have more of an inclusive representative and C system, but also just community because we don't want to over bureaucratize this. I think that that's really a, not an easy approach, but that's the approach we have to take. Ted? Yeah. Um... Adams Morgan Day is one of the best examples. Uh, you were saying it was like eight years ago. I didn't realize it was that long ago. There were some horrible problems with finances because people did not appropriately account for or deal with the money that was involved. And at one point there was huge sums that were coming through the organization um, that were necessary to pay for all of the infrastructure, but also it was the suspicion of many in the community that some of the money got shaken off the trees before it should have been. Um, and we were faced with no longer having an Adams Morgan Day and people who thought it was a good idea got together at, without any sort of formal structure at that point and just said, we're gonna get this done and we're gonna get this done in a way that you know the district allows and also that's within our particular limits in the first Adams Morgan Day that they were involved in, we didn't even close down the street because we couldn't afford it. Um, but there were a lot of people who got actively involved, particularly Atiana, um, and who eventually got it to the point where it's a 501C, whatever it is that's tax deductible, C3 something, um, organization that has a structure and that has, you know, organizational integrity that can carry this forward. And another example would be Calaron Park in particular, the fund for Calaron Park had been very active and involved in trying to um, improve and maintain and make Calorama Park the lovely place that it could be. Um, we still have some challenges. Um, one of the biggest challenges is that DC government is not particularly good on funding, continuing maintenance as opposed to capital projects. But that's one of those things that we, you know, need to work through. But there are people in the community who get involved with the Fund for Calorama Park, with Calorama Citizens Association, with um, Reed Cook Neighborhood Association, and then not in the organizations themselves, but just a, a interest in having something happen. And there was a, a, a fairly substantial group of younger folks who got involved along with Calorama Citizens Association in the lawsuit to uh, protect um, the Sun Trust Plaza. Um, there have been a lot of instances like that over time. Frequently it's because you happen to see something and you have an idea that things could be better. And Lord knows there's a lot of things that we could say about Adams Morgan that could be better, but we need to have people who actually see and then articulate for us what that better might be. Um, we are very fortunate in the uh, uh, housing situation to have uh, Jubilee Housing in the neighborhood. And Jubilee Housing provides just phenomenal, um, very low cost housing. They don't nearly meet the need that we have in the neighborhood, but they're doing just a tremendous job. And the ANC has worked actively with them trying to um, deal with concerns of neighbors about um, people moving into their neighborhood and whether or not it's, it's make the neighborhood less safe. Um, 
having panels, trying to explain to neighborhoods how we reintegrate, particularly returning uh, citizens who have been incarcerated elsewhere. We have a lot of issues that come up that people will get excited about, but you know, then you have to do something about it if you're excited about it. And so remember that you don't need an organization to do this. Individuals are powerful. Individuals can have ideas. Individuals can spark things. You can make a difference and please do because one of the wonderful things about Evans Morgan is the wide variety of talented, interesting, intelligent, enlightened people who live here, who have lots of skills that they can apply if you know who to ask or put something out in, the, in general that attracts them to a particular issue. So please, please get involved. It's your neighborhood. Yes, thank you so much, Ted. I couldn't have said it better myself. It's Adams Morgan is made up of a many, many heroic people who volunteer their time to contribute to making it such a dynamic and wonderful place to live and and to incrementally improve upon all the things that, that do need improving upon, particularly equity issues. Housing was a big part of today's conversation, which I heard loud and clear. And, and I appreciate each and every one of you for playing the role that you do to provide that leadership, to create space for others, to um, have a voice. And like Ted said, there is something for everyone who wants to get involved. And Adams Morgan Day, I'll make a one final plug, is a wonderful place to do that. It is entirely volunteer led initiative, festival, um, year round planning goes into putting the festival together by some extraordinary volunteers. Um, and so grateful to those who, who took on that leadership this year to put together this virtual lineup. So um, yeah, thank you to all of our panelists, to Peter, to Ted, to Nick and John for joining the conversation. Um, thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in and, and for your interest in getting involved in uh, local politics and local advocacy. Uh, there's so many nonprofits in the neighborhood that we didn't really touch on, but that are other channels to get involved in from Mary Center to Jubilee Housing and Life Asset. And um, yeah, so thank you all for, for tuning in. And I, I hear there's a couple of housekeeping items to wrap us up. And so I'll turn it over. Thank you. And thanks everybody on, on this panel. This was really enlightening and good to see from my perspective as somebody who's lived in Adams Morgan for uh, going on seven or eight years now. So thank you all. Um, just looking ahead to the schedule. So the Punk the Capital session is going to start at 515. We have that streaming live on YouTube. Um, we've got that set up on the Adams Morgan Day website. So if you go there, you'll be able to see that. Um, I got a sneak preview of that and it looks really awesome. So I want to encourage folks to check that out here in about uh, 15 minutes. Um, but we did push that back from five to 515. So Good news is it's only a 43 minute documentary. So we'll be able to wrap that up and then finish with persistence in the resistance at six o'clock. Um, so I wanna give one last thank you to everybody on here and uh, hopefully we'll see folks at the uh, next two sessions. Thanks a lot. Happy Mor Adams Morgan Day. Happy Adams Thanks Morgan Day. Thanks Alan.